Welcome to Empower Humans. Welcome to the Empower Humans podcast. This is episode 35 with NoBully.org CEO Will McCoy. I'm excited to bring this to you in both audio and video format. Check out the Empower Humans YouTube channel for the video version of this podcast. And this gentleman, Will McCoy, has been in education uh, from both an educator standpoint as well as administration, even as a district superintendent, kindergarten all the way through high school. He has very extensive experience in all facets of education and has a lot of experience related to this unfortunate topic of bullying that we're going to talk about here. In this topic, we cover everything from the causes and effects of bullying to even how it plays out with adults and some of the things we can do about it. So don't miss this interview. Go ahead and uh, listen to this and go ahead and also support the nobully.org cause in whatever way you can. Reach out to them, donate to them, help them and in whatever way you can. October is Bullying Prevention Month also. So whenever you're listening to this, whether it's October or some other time, support this cause and let's uh, get rid of this problem in our society. I want to remind our listeners, as always, that you are priceless, you're never alone, and we're always here for you with lots of love and support. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash empowerhumans. That's audibletrial.com slash empowerhumans altogether. Browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash empowerhumans. Now enjoy our interview with NoBully.org CEO, Will McCoy. We are here with the one and only CEO of NoBully.org, Will McCoy. How are you doing today, Will? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good. We met uh, recently at the... San Francisco Dance Film Festival right. and kind of hit it off and had a little conversation there. And I loved some of the things you had to say. So I said, hey, why don't we get you on the podcast to talk more about this? I appreciate that. Thank you. These are these are important topics, this whole bully uh, situation. And I want to talk to you a lot about the organization and some of, of what we do or some of what you do. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd like to kind of start, if you don't mind, Tell me a little bit about the history of the organization, No Bully, and, and kind of how that started. Okay. Nicholas Carlisle is our founder. Uh-huh. And about 10 years ago, he was doing his research related to his psycho- psychotherapy degree. And he was fascinated by bullying as a victim of bullying himself as a child. He knew that there were long-lasting personal impacts mm-hmm. and wanted to find out and do research. He... Uh, has a background as a barrister, working for Amnesty International, incredible causes, and decided to take up anti-bullying as his primary cause in his lifelong work. Right. So about 10 years ago, he started working with schools and working with individuals to really learn about the, what do we know about bullying and what do we know about the prevention of bullying? That's when he developed what's called our solution team approach. And over the next three years, he started piloting Solution Team IDEA in different schools locally here in the Bay Area. Then we started to grow, and there was an additional interest uh, from schools, which is wonderful. Yeah. And we really started to develop to develop out our school program. So we expanded, uh, actually on a national level, we'll be in over 200 schools this year, serving more than 150,000 students, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, We have 20 trainers nationwide uh, that we employ, and each trainer works with each school at least three times. I mean, we are deeply embedded within the system. Our flagship product is called the Solution Team, a one-year program. Okay. And we're really, we're a three-year program, but our flagship product is about getting in with the schools, partnering with the schools, and doing deep professional development on the identification and intervention of bullying. Um, so that being said, Nicholas developed this slowly over time and has grown us out to where we are now. Wow. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and this month we're actually launching our Power of Zero campaign, which is anti-cyberbullying. And that's an in- international uh, campaign where we have amazing partners like AT&T, Facebook, Hasbro, and... Um, I can't remember our other partner right now. Oh, UNESCO. Yeah. Uh, so 
we have we have lots of great partners and and Microsoft as well. Uh, lots of great partners supporting our work on an international stage right now. Wow! And didn't you guys uh, correct me if I'm wrong? I think I saw recently you did a a video campaign something with with Burger King. Right. Yeah, uh, we did a, a PSA slash uh, commercial. Yeah. With Burger King, uh-huh. and it was the largest campaign that Burger King had ever done as far as the impressions made by by the campaign. Wow. Um, it, billions of impressions worldwide. It was fantastic. Yeah. And so we're we're working on part two of our Burger King campaign, and it was outstanding. It it simply showed. Uh, people having their their Whopper Junior bullied versus a junior in high school being bullied yeah. in a Burger King, and that most people ignored the student that was being bullied, but paid attention when their own food was bullied, and so it was a very interesting wow. dichotomy where they would complain and go straight to management when their their food had been mistreated, but were sitting next to a human that was being mistreated and said nothing. Wow. So it, it was a fascinating campaign, and we love to use it in all of our presentations because it, it hits you right in the heart and really brings to light the importance of standing up against bullying. Wow. Yeah, and I saw one, I think it was yesterday, about uh, some kids talking that uh, being separated at the lunch tables and all right. that kind of thing, too. Yeah. And it kind of impacted me because, you know, we all grew up. You know, maybe different uh, times, more or less, but it's kind of a an ongoing issue that maybe has gotten potentially worse over the years with the onset of new technology, the internet, right. cyberbullying, right. and uh, and so it, some of that breaks my heart to see. Yeah. And it seems like it'd be real helpful as as you have different angles like this Burger mm-hmm. King thing that you right. just described, as well as. Uh, some of these other kids who maybe aren't bullied so much, maybe understanding what these kids who are bullied feel right. Right. and maybe realizing, boy, I wouldn't want to feel that way. Not Because sometimes maybe kids don't empathize as much, do you think? Right. Well, and empathy and compassion are, are traits that we know can be taught. And so really at the root of all of our different programs is is training kids about empathy and compassion. Yeah. Down to together table. That That's the, the advertisement, well, the program that you're, you're referencing from Capri Sun. It's called the Together Table. Oh, Capri Sun. My right. apologies. Okay. And, I don't know. It's not a problem. And uh, <laughs> it's actually today being featured on the National Mall. Uh, so the Together Table is out on the National Mall in front of the Washington Monument. Great. There's a big rollout. Uh, and kids are signing it, committing to sit with other kids at lunchtime and be nice to other kids at lunchtime, as well as through Twitter, kids can virtually put their name on that list and it'll be written on the table as well. So it's this national symbol of being together and being kind at lunchtime. It's, wow. it's a fantastic campaign. That sounds so awesome. Yeah. I'm so excited for that. Now, uh, as far as you personally, you have a background in education. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. Right. Sure. I, I've taught everything from preschool through high school. Wow. And I started out as a preschool teacher and absolutely loved it and taught all the other grades and absolutely loved them. Uh, I specialized in working with programs for at-risk students and just building meaningful relationships and connecting them to academics, uh, providing great support. Sometimes they are the, the victims of bullying and sometimes they were the bullies. Um, but regardless, I was able to connect with them and, and enjoy that work very much. Mm-hmm. Through that work, I developed programs, but I was also promoted to a school administration, became a school principal, and then... Uh, worked at turning around schools that had been failing or, or were experiencing challenges. It's called being a turnaround principal. That was what I did. Yeah, yeah. And then I was promoted and brought on as a turnaround superintendent for a couple of districts wow. to really try and help them develop their climate, their culture, their academic performance. And at the same time, I had developed this kind of consultancy. And No Bully asked me to consult on a position called the VP of, of Education Programs. Yeah. And so I helped him develop the, the job description. And I said, when I was done helping him write it and develop it and craft it, I went to him and I said, this is a fantastic job. I would apply for this job. And they said, well, let's talk. <laughs> and so I actually got to write my own job description. I landed that job. And then three months later, they asked me to consider becoming a CEO. Wow. So, so. 
So it, it, preceding this no bully, uh -huh. amazing uh, organization and, and faucet of your career, right. you've covered kind of the full gamut of education. Sounds I like have. preschool to high school, right. administration, principal, superintendent. Right. So you, you've probably observed a lot in the school system. I mean, how would you say, uh, plus you grew up, went to school, sure. obviously, you get sure. jobs like that. How has bullying evolved during your lifetime, would you say? I think that the basics of bullying have pretty well stayed the same, but the techniques and the approaches have changed. Mm. Cyberbullying wasn't a thing growing up, right? Um, you know, prank phone calls was about as close as we got. Yeah. <laughs> and mm. uh, But with the onset of cyberbullying, it has just infused this whole new vehicle for power imbalance, which is essentially what bullying is, is one person is trying to absorb mo more power than the person that they're interacting with, right? Mm. And so that that power indifference or power differential is universal, but the ways in which people approach it, the anonymity of, of the digital space seems to have enhanced bullying, in my opinion, mm. just because you don't have to look at the person you don't have to read their response you don't have to engage with them in order to be cruel to them it's like talking behind someone's back on a regular basis yeah right and so the onset of digital bullying I, it really hit as i was a principal and it's a new world for schools to deal with that you know there are laws and regulations that we were unfamiliar with laws and regulations that needed to be put into place yeah. uh, in order to effectively manage the issue and Lots of training that had to happen related to sexting and all of the different pieces that come with cyberbullying. Mm. And so as schools are learning to respond, uh, I got to be a, a, a part of that and a part of that learning. Um, but it, it is still moving faster than school systems typically can adapt. And so just as you know, administrators learn what Snapchat's about, well, it's on to something else. It's on to another uh, modality. So it, it's fascinating the way that the technology has changed the communication structures, but it's certainly a challenge for schools to be able to manage that, especially when it comes to bullying and the impacts on your school. Even if it happens at 11 o'clock at night, that person shows up for school upset if mm. they've been bullied. Yeah. And the parents expect the schools to be able to take care of it, even if it's beyond our purview. Sure. And so all of the social engagement and social um, challenges that are experienced with cyberbullying make their way onto school campuses every day. And it, it's certainly a challenge for everyone involved. Okay. Yeah. You see, and it used to be that you could more or less escape by being done with school, right. go home, uh, you know, Maybe they were dreaded going back to school the next day, but now with the internet and the smartphones and the whole thing, it's it's hard to escape all that. Mm -hmm. um, I, how do we define, because you mentioned earlier the whole thing about power right. situation. How do we define bullying? In other words, is there a threshold where certain teasing is okay, but maybe not categorized as bullying per se? Well, you have to look at the power differential between the students. Okay. Um, if you have two students that are perceived to have equal power and they're just kind of joking back and forth, mm -hmm. we wouldn't consider that bullying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it may or may not be appropriate, but we wouldn't necessarily consider it bullying. Mm -hmm. Bullying is something that occurs on multiple occasions where there's an extreme power differential. Uh, and so that is kind of the benchmark by which we, we judge that. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a student that could be characterized as a victim. Okay, yeah. that, that sounds like a bullying or a harassment situation. Yeah. Um, and so really just that power imbalance and the, it can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be social, all those different types of bullying, verbal uh, and online, all of those can have, have elements of either equity and teasing amongst friends or if there's that power differential that comes into play then that's bullying and, and needs to be addressed. Okay. Okay, that's that's a good way that we could start to differentiate. Because mm -hmm. kids always seem to want to tease each other and maybe define their place in the world. And then you've right. got 
Uh, you've got certain power situations. I don't like labeling. There, right. Sometimes people might say words like jock or nerd or sure. or rocker. You know, when I was a kid, I played music, so I was a rocker kid. Right. I played the drums. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily bullied so much. If you don't mind me asking, when you were a kid, were you bullied by chance? I, some, yes. Um, I was very short for my for my age, okay. always, and I had physical challenges, uh -huh. and so I had multiple surgeries growing up. I was either normally on crutches. Uh, as an adult, I was in a wheelchair for about a year. Oh wow! Uh, used to walk with two canes. Had some extensive physical disabilities. And uh, received some some teasing about that. Mm. Uh, I remember specifically in high school, I had to go through some major hip surgeries. And afterward, as I was going through the through the therapy, the muscles in, within my hips were tight, so I had a bit of a, a penguin walk, mm. right? Yeah. And that differentiated me from the group, wow. right? Just just my walk, as I was having recovered from all these surgeries and all these uh, challenges. And I remember specifically being teased about that um, until people got to know me and, and then realized, oh, wow, he's, he's been through a lot. That's because his body's adapting, not because he's weird or, or whatever, mm. Um, mm -hmm. which is another key to preventing bullying is making sure that kids have the opportunity to really know each other. It's much easier to bully when someone's anonymous, right? When you can just pick out something that's very shallow without a story and a character and a person behind it. Yeah. So if you just see someone and they're short and you happen to be tall, which I've never have been, um, then it's easy to just say, ah, oh, kid, you're short. But when that person is a real person, a real human with feelings, back to compassion and empathy, it's more difficult to draw that simple line, make that power division, because that person that's short could grow up to be your heart surgeon someday. Mm -hmm. right? So you need to really consider who it is that uh, you're you're judging so shallowly. Yeah. So so right. in a lot of ways, this whole area is real close to your heart oh, because you experience some of it. Plus, you've seen it at the right. education administrative levels. Um, now, one thing I wanted to touch on too is is there kind of a difference in how this plays out among boys versus girls? Right. Um, I I can only speak to what I've seen. In, the, in schools, fourth grade and fifth, fifth, fourth grade and fifth grade girls are some of the most relentless bullies, can be some of the most relentless bullies that I've ever seen. Wow. It seems like they're really trying to develop, develop their social norms, their acceptance, and they can be friends at eight o'clock, be enemies by 815 <laughs> and get back together and be in class by 930. Oh, wow. There are just these, these uh, social dynamics at play that really can can hurt other young women primarily uh, boys i i haven't seen o over my career a big shift in boys behaviors um, only frankly the, the only change that i've really seen is in the dynamic where you add the the digital space and the cyberbullying issues with sexting and with the social aspects of interacting with girls um, a, a young woman that maybe makes a poor choice and shares a picture she shouldn't have mm -hmm. um, is more uh, can become more of a target if that boy makes bad choices with whatever picture is sent or whatever is said. Um, so it it gives additional power to the young men mm -hmm. to use at their discretion, which obviously we we uh, don't encourage. Of course, but 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 young women. Um, it, young women can be can be quite uh, vicious in their bullying. Now, uh, do you find young women uh, get physical at all, or is it right. more just a lot of words and looks? You know, girls. I, I've seen the spectrum. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been involved. I, I worked at some schools in inner city urban areas mm -hmm. where physical contact between girls was not uncommon, mm. and so that uh, can. Well, obviously, it's detrimental all the way around. But I, I think that you see the spectrum in both boys and girls where, um, you know, it ranges from what starts as a simple tease all the way through physical bullying. You see the spectrum with both sexes and probably equally. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, none of it's okay. Of course. 
Of course. It's, it's interesting to see how the difference, and you talk about fourth and fifth grade girls. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're at, we're at an age there where puberty is starting and hormones, right. these other things. I, I wonder how much that plays right. into it. Do we, do we get any sort of uh, experts weighing in on these different things that go on at different ages that contribute to this by chance? Well, I think that there's a lot of research related to bullying that's being done right now and being undertaken because everyone is seeing what a global challenge it is. Yeah. One in three children internationally are bullied. One in three. That's just simply not okay. Wow. wow. Uh, it's actually qualified by the UN as a crisis. Uh, a, a, a crisis related to children. And so that being said, there's a lot of retention, a lot of resource, a lot of research dollars being put into it. Yeah. Um, there's a, an international bullying forum now that takes place each year. Uh, this year it'll be in Dublin in June. We're hoping to be able to attend and, and, and present. But uh, yeah, it, it's a global crisis. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would be considered an epidemic if it were a disease. Yeah, and, and I wonder how much... Uh, the landscape around us has to do with this. In other words, we look at our political system. We won't name any names. Sure. We look at <laughs> business and other right. things. There's a lot of things that go on there that kids observe too that could easily be classified as bullying. So I, I wonder right. if we talk about focusing on the kids, and there's probably a lot that can be done there. Right. But in terms of leading by example, I wonder how we're doing in the in that arena yeah, that's a tough one to comment on. <laughs> uh, certainly, I, our push is kindness, empathy, compassion, uh, and to to countermand what, whatever we're seeing on the on the national and international arena. Yeah, um, I I feel for the, anyone that's bullied, and uh, I I certainly see ample examples of uh, bullying on the national scale. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I do think that just to be a little bit more frank, we have seen an uptick in uh, politically acceptable bullying. You know, things that are accepted on a national scale, we see that it's more prevalent within the last couple of years. Yeah. And so that's a, of concern. Well, and it seems to me that there's been a, an increase in coldness in general I can't speak to the global scale of that. I've right. grown up and lived most of my life in America, been overseas a few times here and there, but uh, it seems like the, there's an increase in kind of, or a lack of empathy as right. well as, as we've gone. And I wonder maybe how much the internet has to do, where you talk right. about this faceless bullying, where it's not face-to-face sure. -face so sure. much. It's, uh, I don't know how much goes on in the schools, but it seems like a good portion, right. maybe at least half, probably goes on right. on the internet and social media these days too. Yeah, probably quite a bit. I think one of the challenges that we're seeing as a society is that we are so polarized that we've lost the ability to dialogue well. Yeah. Right? You're either one end of the spectrum or the other. And that conversation, quality conversation where people will sit down and have a good dialogue where they can agree to disagree, but at least talk through in a very uh, respectful, compassionate, empathetic manner and truly listen, not just present their own points. Uh, I, I think that there has been a slide on a on national level where we have lost the ability to dialogue and have disagreements in a respectful way, but also go in with open ears to be able to listen to what the other side is trying to say. Yeah. Um, it, it, it disheartens me whenever I see, uh, let's say, a national debate, for example, and you see the sides come in so polarized mm -hmm. that they almost don't allow the opportunity to step toward the middle of whatever the, the topic is, that they're no longer engaging in dialogue. It's partisanship. And uh, I, I think that that sets a poor example. Yeah, and th and there's been an there's been an increased gap between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. There's probably a lot of uh, disillusioned people as far right. as the adults and leading by example with the kids. And right. you know, I remember when I was in high school, it was Bob Dole and Bill Clinton, I uh -huh. believe, and and so there'd be these discussions in high school class about all that. And kids tended to just reflect what their parents would say. So there's uh -huh. a lot to that, even though the high school kids like to say and feel, no offense high school kids out there, right. that, that they're real independent and they're developing that. But sure. a lot of it, they still 
kind of regurgitate back what their parents are saying too. And then, and then we talk about this national scale as far as the political system debates. Sure. Uh, I think to the origins of this great nation, mm-hmm. we call ourselves the United States. So we got blue and red and all this on the on these TV programs. We draw right. out these color maps. And how, how do you think that has affected things too, where we kind of have this polarized thing now? Well, I, I think that it's it's easy for the media to categorize, right? It's easy for the media to kind of whip up and say, um, you know, look at this differential because that, I mean, a good argument makes good television, right? It, a, a, a good agreement probably is, is less easy to televise. Right. right. Uh, but even as, if you, you know, thinking back to the Clinton Dole debate, they were still two very good diplomatic debaters. Yeah. I mean, they, they were much more open in the debate that you're referring to, um, to each other, and they would acknowledge hearing each other. And even if they disagreed, they're both great orators, yeah, but course. also quality politicians that were willing to listen. Um, I don't know that I've seen that um, exemplified lately. Yeah, it's, there's been an evolution with the internet, and I, I love that you guys are helping get to the bottom of it and get uh, right. reach these kids and, and get this message across because it's definitely high time <laughs> that some adjustments be made. I'd, I'd, I'd say, too... When we look at bullies, I recently listened to this book called The Boy Crisis. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to be interviewing the authors of that book as well. Wow. And um, yeah, Dr. John Gray and Dr. Uh, Farrell, and they talk in that book that fascinated. The book is powerful and fascinating. And girls, by the way, have challenges too. This whole. Sure. uh, But in any event, that's the topic of that book. But it talks about the bullies and the bullied. And frequently, there's a lot of common threads between both. Right. In, ter- in terms of their home environment and how they're raised. Right. Do, you, do you have any insight on that? Well, you know, in my opinion, bullies are looking for power, right? And there's a reason they're looking for power. They don't either don't feel self-confident and empowered on their own, or they've had that power taken from them somehow else. Yeah. There's almost always a deeper story to a bully. And so that's why our approach is not a discipline-based approach. We don't punish the kid because he's a bully. We, we take that student, include him in a solution team, teach him alternative behaviors to bullying, model alternatives to, to bullying, and then hold him accountable to do things that are alternatives to bullying. So it's a retraining versus a, a discipline-based approach. It's It's innovative and it's effective we're able to stop nine out of ten incidences of bullying and we have that data validated by using our approach instead of the disciplinary based approach so it's not only helping the victim no longer be bullied but well helping the victim no longer be a target but it's helping the bully learn new ways of behaving and what we're actually seeing is that a bully from one solution team will often volunteer to be a pro-social example in the next solution team that we run Great. because they like learning what's the appropriate way to interact and how can I find my own self-confidence and they can find that through positive behaviors they just didn't know how to do it sometimes yeah that's that's a great approach I'm a big believer in learning and education as solutions to all kinds of things, and right. especially probably with this bullying topic, with what you're talking about. Right. Tell me a little bit more about these solution teams, okay. if you don't mind, and of how course. that works. Is, is it kind of on a general level where we go in and do an assembly at the school, or do right. we go grade by grade or class by class, or do we single right. out the bullies and round them all? <laughs> I doubt that, but go well, ahead. Well, it, it, it's honestly not far from that. So... Uh, If there's an instance of bullying that occurs on a school campus, then we first speak with the target and say, are you okay? Do you need help? Is there anything that we can do? Hmm. And then we offer to run a solution team around that student. So we get the student's consent, and then we meet with a group of, say, six students. And three of the students would be those that are involved in the bullying-type behavior, and three are pro-social students, the students that are like sunshine with tennis shoes, that walk your campus and you want, you want a classroom full of them, right? <laughs> sure. So then you, you hold a solution team meeting and you say, okay, well, let's talk about, and I'll, I'll just use a student's name, let's say Fred. 
Fred is the target. Fred has, is being bullied. He's having a really hard time. Uh -huh. So then you start building on their compassion and their empathy. Fred gets dirt put in his water bottle. He gets pushed in the hallways. No one sits with him at lunch. And he gets teased about his haircut. Yeah, yeah. So you really lay out. So he doesn't like coming to school. He, he's very unhappy. And we, we need the solution team needs to come up with an, an answer. How, do we, how can we help Fred? What is something that each of us can do or stop doing that will help Fred have a better day and a better school experience? Yeah. And then we work with all six of those students. And of course, the pro-social students have great ideas, right? I can help him do his homework. I can sit with him at lunch. I can say hi to him in the hallways. Yeah. I ride the bus. I can ride to the bus with him. Yes. All of those pro-social things that are the examples, right? Love and it. then you get to those students that are have not exhibited pro-social behaviors to this point, and you say, what can you do or stop doing? And they'll either choose, hey, I can talk to him more, or I'll be nice, or I can stop pushing him in the hall. I can stop put, <laughs> putting dirt in his water bottle. Any of those things will help, and then we get their commitment to stick with it. Yeah. So yeah. then we do that. A week later, the, the group reconvenes, and the solution team meetings are quite quick, 15 minutes. Because they're kids. They don't want to sit for a, a lasting you know, rhetorical dialogue. Yeah, yeah. They, they just want a quick answer. Uh, then we check back in with Liam a week, or with Fred a week later and say, Fred, how's your week been? And, wow, it's a little better. I've noticed these things. Then you meet with the solution team again. All right, how did it go? Well, I did this, I did this, I stopped doing that. And you, you reinforce the behaviors and say, okay, well, I checked in with Fred and he's, he's feeling better. You guys, this is working. Thank you so much. You reinforce that positive. I really appreciate how he got to have a clean water bottle all week. I appreciate mm -hmm. how he, I saw him eating lunch with someone, yeah. all of those different things. Build that up. Yes. Then with the third meeting, you go in and, and you invite Fred. And you have Fred tell his story about how different his, his experience is at school. Yeah. So it's reinforcing directly. And they're saying, hey, you know, I, I, I enjoyed having lunch with you. I enjoyed, you know, being nice. You're really funny, Fred. I didn't know that. Yeah. All of those types of behaviors and then reinforce that. Sometimes there's a fourth meeting, but it often doesn't take a fourth meeting. Wow. Then what we do is follow up with the student three months later and say, okay, did it stick? Are... are are you, is school still going well for you? Still happy? And in nine out of 10 cases, it's yes. Great. Things are going better. Great. And not only that, in the meantime, those that have been part of that first solution team often will volunteer for another solution team for another student. Yeah. So it kind of helps spread from there. It's a great system. Wow. And, and we found it to be very effective. So we go through and we train schools how to, how to do all of this that I'm talking about. We have parent trainings, staff trainings mm -hmm. and then we work with the leadership team of the of the school over a three-year uh, time span on what is the climate and culture of your school yeah is it acceptance is it respect is it compassion is it empathy so that we can build that into the the grain of the school so that mm -hmm. everyone knows hey at Harper Middle School, we treat each other with empathy and respect. Yes, yes. So that it's in every message, it's in all the posters, it's on the voicemail, it's at the bottom of the principal's email. All of that positive messaging, we go in and we help them reinforce that throughout their school culture so that then bullying is just not what they do at that school anymore. Yes. Yeah, I Thank you for explaining that. Of that course. is a good, thorough explanation. And I love that what you do is you get a team together, thus the name. Right. And... and you build a momentum, right. you create commitments and accountability. Right. And then in that process, there's there's a natural learning that takes place, maybe a, a little uh, disruption in the mind of what was the former pattern, especially right. on those side of the bully, mm -hmm. that, that might change behavior both towards Fred in that case right. or whatever moving forward in their life that maybe... Uh, these these habits don't continue as they they become adults too. So right. and, and then the on, yeah yeah exactly. And, and I love how there's a whole thing of of creating a culture at a at a general grander scale at the school. Right. Um, how important is that as far as getting a culture? Because we talk about culture in business. We talk mm -hmm. about culture at a national level. We have these national holidays and all these cultural right. things. 
Right. But in a school, how important is that to, to have a culture? I would say it's one of the three most important elements of a school is what are the expectations for behavior and how we're going to treat each other and the level of respect we're going to show. And that's not only adult to student and student to student, but adult to adult, which is another area that we're beginning to explore as an organization is how can we build that positive workplace culture for teachers, for principals, for all of the people at the school? Because if if they're not experiencing a positive culture at their level, that trickles down into the interactions with students and families. So how can we support that school culture for the adults as well as for the students? It, it's critical in nature. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned corporate culture. We are uh, getting inquiries on a regular basis about going in and working with corporations now. So that's a piece we're, ex we're exploring. Oh, wow. And also, we've heard from colleges and universities about anti-hazing campaigns. Yes. Their yes. belief that hazing comes from bullying, yeah. and that if we can stop bullying, then we can cease hazing on college and, and university level. Wow. So it's incredibly exciting to see that our work is now beginning to thread all the way from ages zero to eight with our Power of Zero campaign through our school age through to college and university and now into workplace. We're, we're incredibly excited and fortunate to be in that position. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and I think too, when you talk about hazing, I, I think to this whole thing, there's some things that seem to be natural or at least uh, ingrained in us. I don't know if it's DNA for generations where well, we boys, for example, and girls too have certain rites of passage. And so uh, there's been some unhealthy patterns created with things Without like question. hazing that for your rite of passage, you need to pass through all these trials and right. and bullying sort of behavior. Right. Um, and, and so I, I appreciate that you're bringing that up too because the university level, whatever started in third grade and high school, continues right. on at the... <laughs> it, it can, and I, and I know that there have been you know, lots of instances where, where hazing has become dangerous. Um, and really, I, I appreciate that there's this national movement, an anti-hazing coalition, where they're, they're drawing the line, this is no longer okay, this is not acceptable, and we need to address it. So they're doing that a variety of ways, and they've invited us to come alongside and see if we can not help. Great. And are there any other programs that uh, are rolled out in these schools sure. besides these teams and so forth? Right. Well, uh, our Power of Zero campaign is is our anti-cyberbullying campaign, which we're now taking international. Mm -hmm. It is training students from a very early age. We know that kids are interacting with devices at an earlier and earlier age, right? Smartphones, iPads, all of those different things. And we're trying to teach them compassion and empathy and what we're calling powers, their powers for good as far as how to block someone that may be harassing them, how to tell someone how to ask for help. We're teaching them these different powers that they can apply to the digital world. So that this is even for our youngest students, kindergarten, first grade even, teaching them they have power on the, not only in their interactions in the real world, but in their interactions in cyberspace. Yeah. Great. training them and we're doing a massive rollout on january 16th with scholastic which mm. is the premier provider of educational materials in the u.s yeah and we'll be sending out over six hundred thousand magazines specifically about kids using their power for good through anti-cyberbullying efforts and the power of zero we're honored to be partnered and working with them and all of our sponsors that i mentioned earlier but really six hundred thousand Kids yeah. will be will be impacted and will receive something. Will receive information that will help them be a better digital citizen. Well, that's excellent. So we're, wow, we're incredibly excited. And I love your use of the word power. I mean, as you know, our podcast is Empower Humans, and right. you talked earlier about the bully side. There's a power element there, mm -hmm. and so on a certain scale, a certain level, we're empowering those who are being bullied or those who sure. are witnessing it too, right. with with skills and knowledge and techniques to combat it. Not violently, not obviously any unhealthy right. way, but right. they're being empowered. And so I love that. So we're giving them power as well. And so we've talked a lot about the school scale. Did you want to elaborate right. any more on any of those things? You know, it really, our, our school-based programs uh, fall into two categories. We have what are called fee-for-service schools where we're approached by a school 
and we and we work with them uh, on a regular basis throughout the year, as I described. We also have sponsored schools, and so we're we're very fortunate to work with Major League Baseball, ESPN, Hasbro, and AT and T. They sponsor schools in their areas and in certain areas. For example, uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. I have to I always try and highlight them. The Pittsburgh Pirates, as a as an organization, sponsored about a dozen schools to go to have no bully training. Wow. And they they looked to Pittsburgh School District, and Pittsburgh School District stepped up and sponsored about a dozen schools as well. So we're now serving 24 schools with our program in the Pittsburgh area yeah. because yeah. of our amazing partners and because school districts are stepping forward and saying, we need to help. We need to do something. This can't be ignored. So we have our sponsored programs, our fee for service programs, and uh, we're very we're very pleased. We have some research coming out uh, from a three year study that we did with on in Oakland schools to prove out the efficacy of our programs. Mm -hmm. So we worked with West Ed, who's an independent research organization, and the. Uh, next week I'll be going through the research document that they have uh, put together related to this three-year study. Very positive initial uh, review of that data. I'll be going more in-depth with it next week, but very uh, supportive of our work, our approach, and how effective our system is. Great. I, it's great that you have so many partners scattered oh. around, corporations, yes. sports teams, uh, all these right. sorts of things help a lot. And, and a lot of the youth look to a lot of these things. You know, AT&T Absolutely. provides, you know, phone service and they eat right. their food at Burger King or <laughs> whatever the case may be. Sure. And I, I, I realize there's different things that these different organizations do, but mm -hmm. then they see, oh, these are all partnered with this. That, that lends more credence to what you're doing when you right. walk into a school to say, look, all these organizations that you're a part of and spend money with right. are also supporting us. Yeah. So listen up a little bit, right. <laughs> a little well, bit more too. Certainly, certainly it adds to the um, gravity of, of our organization, right? When we can say yeah. we, we've partnered with these major organizations. But I think as important is that our work is enhancing the work of those organizations. Yes, We're working with Facebook on their digital platform for students mm -hmm. to see how we might be able to use those 12 powers as a guideline. Uh, we're working with AT&T and parents that are buying kids their first cell device, their first smartphone. And what are some things that parents need to know so that their, their child is safe with a smartphone? Yeah, absolutely. So really, it, it's very synergistic, and we're incredibly appreciative, of course, yes. because we, we, couldn't, we couldn't have the reach that we do without, without our sponsors. Of course. And, and a moment ago, you mentioned parents, which uh, leads me to, to ask, when a kid is the bully, mm -hmm. and we'll get into the bullied in a moment, too, Sometimes parents don't even know what's going on. I mean, eventually right. they're probably going to get a call from right. somebody or some other, hopefully not worse, notification that their kid sure. was engaged in bullying behavior. What should the parents, when the when they find out their kid is being the bully in right. school or you know cyberspace, what what should parents do? I think the first thing that I experienced is, at least as an administrator, that I would love parents to consider is what if it's true, mm. right? Because there's a lot of initial denial, defensiveness, all of that. Well, no, that couldn't have been my kid. That that has to have been the other kid. I, uh, I, I don't see that at home, so it can't be happening. So just that general um, immediately, and I'm going to say parent instinct to defend your child, right? But to just ask the question, well, what if it's true? How, how might this be exhibited at school? Is this something my child may have done? And if it isn't, you know, if it was a misidentification, the school can help work through that. Yeah. But go in with at least some open ears that if it is your child, there is an issue. Not something that's insurmountable, but simply something that needs to be addressed. It's going to be a collaboration between the school and the parent to try and resolve it. Hopefully mm -hmm. law, not law enforcement and all the other levels it can go to. But just start with, well, what if it's true? And then having the conversation with your child on alternative behaviors. Yeah. And working in, in collaboration with the school administration. Yeah. And, and maybe what if it's true with with a footnote of there's hope here. We can solve sure. this. 
it's not we're beating right. everyone up right now, but something's going on, and we need to right. we need to take care of this now before it escalates right. any worse. Well, and the retraining aspect of our solution teams is a nice opportunity, right? Of course, yes. So yes, your your child was was picking on someone. We have this ability, this restorative program that allows your student to make it right again mm-hmm. and do the right things. Uh, hopefully, the parent would step up and say, "Yeah, that that seems like a reasonable." approach and and I'd like to learn more or I encourage Johnny or Jimmy or Jane to do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are opportunities to resolve it, but everyone accepting, okay, this is the situation and this is the truth and we're going to work through it um, as with any situation. That's that's a great place to start. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and, and as we talk about also the bullied from the parental level is also and also them individually some might listen to this podcast who are the bully to make feel alone at the moment we always right. say in our podcast by the way you are priceless and you're never alone we say that at the beginning of every episode so i, I hope that sinks in with these people um no matter where they are their station in life right but if they're being bullied what can parents do and what can these sure. individuals do first show compassion and empathy for your child make sure that he or she is safe and that they have open lines of communication with you. Mm -hmm. Often those that are bullied want to talk about it, but they don't feel like they have a connection with someone that they can talk about it. Um, Of course, there's embarrassment about being bullied and admission that they've, you know, lost some sort of esteem or power or whatever. But someone that is being bullied it has a crisis going on and they need to be able to reach out and talk to someone in best cases that's family that that's mom and dad or big sister or auntie or grandma or whoever that is that there's a real relationship mm-hmm. there that they have someone that they can go to safety is obviously very first primary need yes and so let's make sure everyone's safe to begin with yes and then let's look at what are the situations where the child is being put in danger is it at school? Is it on the walk home? Is it on the bus? Is it behind the mini mart? Because that's the way they have to walk home. What, where are the situations that there are challenges? Mm-hmm. And who can we enlist to help resolve the problem? Often it's the school, right? Because that's where kids spend a third of their day. Yeah. And so working with administration and working with school principals in a, in a positive way, school counselors, all the different staff that are there to help your child, enlist their help and say, hey, you know what? This is what's going on. We just want it resolved. We don't want retaliation. We don't want any of those other negative aspects. What we want is we want it to stop. We want our child to be safe at school or safe in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Having those conversations and bringing those conversations to the forefront are critical if we're truly going to address this as a social issue. The more it's in the dark, the more often uh, people will be able to deny it right? So we commend those schools that that come to us and say, look, we have an issue with bullying and we want to resolve it. Because then there's that acceptance of it's not okay and we're doing something about it. Yes. Um, So we always commend the schools that that admit, hey, there's an issue. And not every school does, right? I I would bet that there's some sort of bullying that goes on on the majority of campuses nationwide. Yeah. The parent's role is to bring it to, the, to light with the school and work in coordination with the school to find a positive resolution to it. Uh, but the, the public discourse needs to occur on a more regular basis so that people take this seriously. We know the ramifications of students who are bullied and bullied and bullied and bullied and either choose self-harm mm. or harm of others. Mm. Uh, when we when we look at the horrendous acts that took place uh, related to school shootings, all of those those horrible things that have happened, mm-hmm. the discussion related to bullying always comes up. Right? Yes, they were bullied. Well, who noticed? Who did something? Who didn't do something? How could we have helped intervene at a much earlier stage to really engage with young people? to prevent horrendous acts from happening, either of self-harm or harm of others. Uh, it needs to be part of the national discourse on a regular basis. Yeah, and uh, and there's so much more that. When I, I graduated high school in 1998, we're dating me a little bit here, 
20 years ago now, and 99 is when Columbine happened, the yeah. next year. And since then, uh, at this dance film festival, there was a short film called yeah. Too Many Bodies. Right. And I can't tell you enough how that affected me. I, I was literally in tears watching that. And I don't, I don't cry easy sometimes. Right. Maybe I'm trying to sound a little tougher here. But, right. uh, but that film and the pictures, they showed pictures of all these people that have been killed, essentially. Yeah. Not yeah. to mention the thousands and thousands of others affected in their families, friends, communities, schools. Right. This is a serious topic. And, and I think of those Columbine kids and... And that broke my heart at the time. I was 18 years old when that took place. And then this other film, Dan Sewer, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that great because right. I'm not French, but basically it's about male dancers. Correct. And boy, these male dancers uh, from a young age, they, they start at age five or 10 or whatever it is, they get bullied. And that film right. really affected me too. Absolutely. There's, there's something to be said for taking care of those who are marginalized, right. whether it's someone bullied because of how they dress, how they look, their hair, how tall they are, they had surgery, sure. these silly things that are inconsequential to who they are. Right. And the dance, like these people, some of the greatest people around, but they're bullied right. because they do something not a lot of people do. Right. And I guess I'm just pouring out my heart a little bit here in this interview because, right. and this is what brought us together because you right. spoke after that Dan Sewer film right. and had some great things to say. And, yeah. uh, so, so we talk about, did you have any other comments on any of that? Well, I, I mean, we have to go from a culture of marginalization to one of celebration. Yes. Really. That they're not like me and isn't that wonderful? Yes. Instead of they're not like me. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, uh, the world would be very boring if we all only ate the same cracker. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> sure. So what, why not celebrate all of the differences that occur in this world? Whatever choices are made, so long as everyone is safe... <laughs> and everyone is being respectful of each other, my goodness, what a richer world we have because of the differences inherent in our society. Yeah. We, we jumped on the opportunity to be able to be co-presenting with Dancer. We felt that it was a great opportunity to really look at one specific uh, segment of the population with a beautiful film, the incredible film, that really shows, okay, this is what bullying, how bullying impacts this particular population. Yeah. But we know that that's not the only population, right? There could be a thousand, 10,000 films about all of the different groups that are marginalized and bullied. Uh, this was a particular opportunity. Too many bodies. Uh, I'm in conversation with the director and choreographer from that. Mm. I met with them after Dancer, and we'll be having continued conversations with them as well. Good. As a school administrator, the fear of a school shooting and the training and all of that uh, was petrifying. Yeah. Oh my having, having worked through different emergencies, and I actually at one point developed a school safety app uh -huh. because I wanted to make it better for my school district. Okay. Um, those threats, unfortunately, are becoming commonplace there are now government films run hide fight right where people are trained if there's a mass shooting here's what you do and that um i'm not going to say acceptance because i don't believe it's acceptance recognition mm -hmm. of the real threat that does exist is really scary for for us as a society yeah. and to have to think about that on a school level in protecting students yes, uh, is a very real and very, um, on the upside, I will say it is has brought law enforcement and education together on yeah. some very important initiatives, mm -hmm. and there's some very good work being done. Sad that the impetus for that collaboration is tragedy, but we'll take the collaboration and I'll, I'll treat it optimistically. Yeah. Yeah. We've had some massive wake up calls yes. in these, this last generation or so. We, we didn't do any of that when I was in school, any of this, right. it was always a fire drill. 
Right. You'd walk outside and come back in. Right. There was never, if there's a shooting or some sort of attack. or right. We didn't think that way. Right. And I'm sure even much less, you're, right. you're not too much older than me. No, I don't but think so. But even in your era growing <laughs> up, I... <laughs> right. Well, school shootings have been happening for the last century. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the history of them. But the frequency has just been ramping up so much that it is... Uh, Epidemic. I think that film said, if I'm not mistaken, there have been 232 school shootings just since Columbine in 1999. Right. And that's less than 20 years. I right. mean, that's an average of over 10 per year. And granted, they're not all on a grand scale, but the fact that it even happens is a tragedy. Absolutely. The fact that a gun is even fired or brought on a school campus is a tragedy. Agreed. And we've got to we've got to live up to our name in this nation and. Granted, this podcast may go out to anyone in the world, but in the United States, let's be united. I can't say that enough as I watch these things unfold. Um, as, as we kind of wrap up here pretty soon, is there anything else parents can do to stay on top right. of this, a little more maybe proactive approach? Sure. I, I think that with the onset of cyberbullying, that parental controls and parent... Uh, engagement with their students about cyberbullying mm -hmm. and their children about cyberbullying. Uh, there's a statistic from a recent research report that's about to be released. Something about 90% of parents believing they know everything their child does online and 70% of teens saying that they hide content that their parents can't see. Yeah. <laughs> so Jeez. not different from mm. when we were hiding the notes that we passed in my generation. Yeah. However, there's this disconnect between parents and teens related to the cyber uh, space. Yeah. And we need to close that. We need to, we need to provide good examples. Do you have uh, device-free dinners? Yes. Do you have conversation about what cyberbullying is? Do you talk with young women about the dangers of sexting and, and posting provocative pictures? All of those things where parents really need to, to lean in because there is this additional anonymous space that their children are interacting in. Mm -hmm. And they really need to be aware that it can be a dangerous place. It doesn't feel dangerous, right? It's just on your phone. It's like a game. No, any, po any picture you post can be there for years. And Indefinitely. so just to really consider that deeply and to have that level of respect for the powers that each child brings to the, to the digital space. Yeah. And I've, I've seen parents, too, talk about that uh, different ideas about when to give a child a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to comment too much as we wrap up here on that. But maybe a more thoughtful approach of maybe we don't give them a smartphone when they're 10 uh, with access to the internet. Maybe they still have a phone where they can right. call me and text me if needed, right. but having access to the internet and all the social media. I don't. F Facebook, I believe, their technical age is 13 to right. be on there. So all these things parents sh should probably be p cognizant of. Well, parents need to be parents all the time. Yeah. And if Big they're going to give their child a smartphone, the parent has responsibilities with that, not just the child to take care of the phone. Of course. The parent needs to parent. Um I, I I don't I don't know what the right time is to give a child a smart device or anything like that, but I do know that the time for a parent to engage and have those conversations is always. Yeah, and and in this book, the boy crisis, they talk about especially with boys, but the whole family. It's real important to have a family dinner night, even if it's right. just once a week. If it's not sure. every day, people get busy, all the different events and sports, right. whatever it might be. But to have a family dinner night, right. just as we throw out tips, these are just things. Sure. Um, do you have anything else you want to add on any of that as far as well, what they I, can do? I know that you know the gaming community is a place where a lot of bullying can occur. Uh, there are limits that parents can put on gaming, but also I, I play Fortnite with my son. My son's 13 years old. Great. And we play together. And so I have a feel for what the game is, what it's about, all the things that are going on so that then I can engage with him and have that conversation instead of him saying, oh, I was just playing a game. You know, that disconnect is, I won't say dangerous, but it provides the opportunity for um, consequences we don't predict. Yeah. And so 
closing that gap and being involved in your child's life, both in the real world and in the cyber world, is something we would definitely recommend. Yeah, I love that because having a rapport with the kids, uh, maybe connect to them sure. with them at their level, uh, technologically, uh, literally and figuratively connecting with our kids, right. hugs, talking right. with them, right. it's family dinner night, play Fortnite, all these things are powerful. Right. And it's just making a little decision. Instead of watching, uh, you know, we won't name names, whatever it might be for as long, right. let's spend a little more time with, with the eight-year-old Johnny or nine-year-old Sally or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if parents name their kids Sally anymore, but we love all the Sallys out there. That's right. And and all the rest of you. And last couple questions. Is there anything else, the other kids who may be kind of more on the sidelines just watching these things unfold, anything else they can right. do? Well, certainly we encourage, and the Burger King ad, back to the Burger King ad, really showed this. We encourage people to stand up for, for others that are being bullied. The... It means so much to know that there's an ally, there's someone in their community that is looking to help. So kids that may be strong and have that self-assurance and confidence, but don't necessarily engage in when they see discord happening, mm -hmm. for those kids to step up and say, hey, wait, this is not okay. We don't, we don't act like that here, not at our school. One of the things when I was a school principal those proudest moments were when interventions happened from among students from other students. So when there was a disagreement and a student stepped forward and said, hey, wait a minute, we're better than this. We don't need to do this here. Those are the moments that we need to celebrate on school campuses, in our community, when others help us do the right thing. Do one more good thing a day and the world would be a better place, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. So just having teaching kids that it's great not only to assert yourself and not be a victim, but also to help those that are in a position where they have lost their power. Yes. Yeah, we always tell our audience, I have a few challenges at the end of these podcasts. We tell we tell our audience, study, start studying if you haven't. Right. Keep studying if you have. Just keep learning and growing. And, and as you learn, you realize you got to love the right. living creations around us, especially other people. Right. And the other challenge is make great moments. And that could be observing someone be bullied, right. wrap your arm around them and say, you know what, that's not you. You're better than that. I'm sorry that's happening to you. I'm going to talk right. to whoever. I know right. kids get worried. We all were there. Sure. If kids think that we don't understand. We know what it's like. Sure. to. You don't want to be the snitch. You don't want right. to whatever. But step up and do something. Even if it's, even if it's, anonymously go into the principal or whatever. I saw this happen. I just think right. you should know. Right. I don't want my name involved, but I want to make you aware. Well, kids need to be empowered in all these areas you said and things like right. that. Do take action, take control of your life and of what's right. Absolutely. Goodness gracious. And right. the last question I have for you is a very simple one. With everything that's transpired here, Mr. McCoy, is there hope? Oh, without question. They, I, I wouldn't do this job if there wasn't hope. Uh, there is always the opportunity to enhance the life of a child, yeah. to make a situation better, to treat each other more respectfully, and to celebrate differences. Without question, there is hope. It's going to take time. We're talking about cultural shift. But we started 10 years ago, and we're going to continue for decades to come. Yeah, And we will walk right alongside anyone else on a positive journey to help make it happen. Great. It's been an honor. Great. Great. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, I love the work you're doing. Thank you. Commend you big time with all this, and I hope you continue to make strides forward. And uh, the people listen to this podcast and that right. uh, attend your events and your various initiatives that you, you right. do in various communities and schools. So thank you again, and uh, maybe we'll do a sequel here down the road and see how things are going. You know what? It'll be good because things will get better. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks so much for listening to Empower Humans. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review this podcast. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit EmpowerHumans.com. We'll catch you next time.